let me let me let you guys in as to why this is happening. Of course, it's master's appreciation, and I know this is easy for you because he's your pastor. And I'm not going to try to explain that to you. I believe I'm capable of explaining it because I pastored and still pastor. And by the way, I used to be at Sun Valley. Now I'm in a Baptist church in uh, in North Hills. That's where I serve. So last week I preached at the Methodist Church. This week I'm preaching here. But you know, it's amazing to hear the the pledge that you guys do. Who do we love? Do you love all other Christians? Yes. And those that do not believe. Wow. That's unconditional. And you know what? The more we say that, I'm gonna need a copy of that if it's show, but if I can get a copy of that, I wanna say that every day too. Uh, in conjunction with you guys. So let me let you guys in on a little uh, the proceedings. I preached here before. If you haven't seen me before, then good because you're new probably. I'm happy for that. Right? And if you've seen me before, then I'm thankful that you are faithful in coming to this church. And I know that you know you, you have a special purpose. And if you can't see it every time you come, then and I'm gonna feel a little sorry for you because when you drive in here, look at what you see, the tourist spot. Right? Now there's only one problem with that tourist spot. The problem there is that when people go there and put their faith in what the tourist spot is selling, you know they're not going to heaven. And of course, the opposite is true. So you have to pray. You have to continue in your zealousness here because you know what? It's a dark corner. This is the light. And the light needs to shine. And it cannot be put under a table. The light cannot be shielded. And so what happened in the interim, I preached here once, and then they invited me again. Even before this, they invited me. And I asked my wife, hey, can I go? And she goes, yeah, yeah, sure. And then 10 minutes later, she's saying, call them back. You know what, we have a holiday. We're not going to be there. And I'm going, okay, that's it. We're never going to get invited anymore. <laughs> but of course, the opposite is true if this has happened now. And so, I'm hoping that in this place, you give your pastor double honor. And I'm pretty sure he's not perfect. And I'm pretty sure he's not the best man, you know, not like the people in the, in the advertising world where the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> we pastors, I think, were able to admit that we are not perfect. We were not called because of our qualifications. But instead, we answer the call, and that call is now something that we need to go and fulfill. We cannot do it by ourselves. We need the help of God. But most of all, in this place, in this very moment, at this time, in your collective lives, pastor needs you to be a part of the team that does it. Okay. So, please remember that. Let's open in a short word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We know there are no coincidences. And thank you, Lord, that uh, against all odds, we are here. I know, Lord, that there are forces, even forces that are close to this place, that are wanting for this place to shut down that are wanting for the Spirit to be quenched. But I thank you, Lord, that in the smallness, comparatively, of who we are right now, especially in the context of this society, you give the light and you give the power. And so, Lord, we bow to you and ask that even as we have wasted time and wasted some portions of our lives in things that are inconsequential, we thank you that today, at this time, as we gather in your name, as the word is preached, that this will not be one of them. Thank you, Lord, for the fruits that we emanate in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm here to do this sermon, and it's titled appropriately, What is the Pastor's Role? You know, some people think that the pastor is the employee of the church. Is he an employee of the church? Well, by law, maybe. Okay? By law, if you look at the documents, if you look at uh, how the IRS treated me while I was pastoring on a senior basis, and by the way, I'm employed, okay? We're doing well. So. 
Let's, let's relax, all right? There was a crisis, there was some sadness, but that's not happening anymore, so, all right. But sometimes we think that the pastor is the employee of the church. So when you see the pastor sweeping the floors, or painting the walls, or cleaning the yard, well, you know what, he's the employee of the church. So, thank you. Just in case. <laughs> so he's an employee, so he should do the work, right? When I'm employed, like right now, I'm employed, they expect me to go to work and do the work. Nobody feels sorry for the fact that I have to spend time on the phones or communicate with clients, no. And so, I'm not saying feel sorry for a pastor that does that, but you know what, that's not a good definition. Because I have a feeling, having known this person, that the pastor here is not supported by people, he's supported by God. You can take your support away, but that doesn't mean God will not support him. So there's a little bit of dark consequences to that happen. So no, no, I don't want to define him as an employee. So maybe we should define him as a, a team leader. Because we work as a team, right? We all come in and we work as a team. So that's true. That's not a derisive, that's not a divisive definition of a ministry. But you know what? He really is not a team leader. He is leading, yes, but it's not just to lead the team. It's not a definitive and enough definition. Because I know this man, he has sacrificed, he has gone through some hard times. Maybe some of you are privileged that you don't hear the sad stories behind the scenes, but as pastors sometimes we talk about it. Not because we're depressed, you know, but really, the truth is that exercise is to affirm the goodness of God in our lives. You know? I don't know him from before 98, so I don't know how many people you punch, <laughs> I don't know how many people you kick, what fights you pick. But if you knew me, okay, before 86, you wouldn't want to listen to my sermons. There's no way. Especially if you have, if you're a man and you have a girlfriend. Not because I'm going to take your girlfriend, but that was our hobby before, harassing people, couples. You know? Better not go into that, that's a long time ago. And so, even as we find imperfections in people, we are happy to say that God calls, and it is God that enables us to do whatever it is that we need to accomplish. We're not able to do anything. I am not, as a pastor, able to accomplish anything. And I look at my ministry from uh, 1986 on, and I know for a fact that there is nothing that I'm able to accomplish that God does not want to do. Because for me, ultimately, here's the ultimate for me. A man comes up, or a woman comes up, and I, now, nowadays, because when a woman comes up, I need my wife there. Okay? But if it's a man, then okay. And if this person listens to the word, as God allows me to speak it from my mouth, this, this little man, be allowed to say whatever it is that God want to say, wants to say to this person so that they may change, so that they may find Jesus. When that happens, you know, that is the ultimate. But you know what? Even as I did that, I did not save the man. I did not forgive his sins. I did not bless him one bit. All these things came from God. So we are but vessels. Okay? So let's continue on. Point number one in your syllabus. A pastor inquires of God for his people. That's a good definition. Because you know what? In reality, okay, and I'm going to say this carefully. God wants to give you a blessing. And for this blessing to happen, there has to be a conduit. You know what a conduit is, right? It is something that enables either power or resources to reach whatever their destination is. Now, Jesus is the conduit of God's blessing for us. Let us not make any mistakes. But in the conduit having to be apparent in a person's life, there is the pastor. There is the pastor. And I'm sure this pastor prays for you. This pastor knows your problems. And you know what? Sometimes it's funny because it's not our problem. It's not our crisis. But behind closed doors, it is. It is. And we have no problem to bury with that. And now this man does that. I've seen him well. I've seen him sick. I've seen him prosperous. 
I've seen him in comfortable situations and in the worst situation, he's still, let's go, praise God. It's an amazing thing. And I observed some things today that just manifest and confirm the sermon today. As I sat there in the back, by the way, I came in and I came in exactly at 10 30 because they told me, don't ruin the surprise. <laughs> don't walk in there like you own the place, you sit there and you be quiet. <laughs> In fact, I told my wife, you know, just go there and be quiet. Don't be saying anything. Because, you know, if he decides to preach, and I'm going to consider this permission because he decided to stay there and still smiling. If he was frowning right now, my next question would be, are you really allowing me? Because I'm okay with that. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit says no, well, we cannot quench that. Right? Yeah. But we have that opportunity today. So 1 Samuel, verse 30, 1 to 2, it says, David and his men reached Siklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Siklag. They had attacked Siklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on the way. So she was a crisis in David's life. She was a problem. What was the problem? Well, the villages where all their families were, were raided by the Amalekites. These Amalekites, of course, are evil people. And so it's an amazing thing, I don't know why, okay, that none of these people were killed. Side point. Crisis happens in life. You agree? Crisis happens in life. But, okay, nothing happens that is not under God's control. Okay? That was a weak amen. You sure? Amen. Nothing happens that is not under God's control. Amen. You get a job, you lose a job, you find your help, you get your help. You know, and I, I know that because you know what? I have a 16-year-old. Let me brag a little bit. Those of you who are friends on Facebook, you already know. My 16-year-old is an athlete. They did not get it from me. <laughs> they got it from my wife. Their family has a history of being good basketball players. It's just amazing. And me, the only time I was allowed on the basketball team was when my basketball team, which was the top basketball team in my barrio in Marikina back then, went to another town, you know, went to another barrio, and got beat up. Not beaten, but beat up. <laughs> so when they came back the next day and we met, they called three of us. A guy named Boy Pates, <laughs> Another guy, oh no, sorry, uh, Vic Pates, one boy baboy, and me. <laughs> and they called us over and they said to the coach, We're playing for you, but you gotta keep them on the team. These three people will go with us on the team. That was my talent. <laughs> Eight rebounds a game, that was my talent. I didn't make my, I made some three point shots, but only during scrimmage. Okay. So my son starts for two varsity teams as a junior in Van Nuys. He's the team captain of the basketball team and he starts for volleyball. But he is, okay, but he is a 16-year-old. That's how you learn as a parent that you need to believe in God. He wants to go to a party, go home at 1 o'clock on a Friday night. Will I do that? Myself? Will I go to your houses and say, oh hey, let's have a costume party? Let's go home at 1 o'clock? And I'm thinking all the drunk drivers are coming out at that time. But no, that's him. And I need to give him that freedom because you know what? My father gave me that freedom also. I asked him, I said, Did there's going to be alcohol there, no, there's not going to be that. Okay. I need to trust. But I'm not trusting my son. I am trusting God. Amen. And so crisis, I cannot defend him, you know, okay, a little bit more about it. Okay, good luck. When I was growing up, the problem in school was what? Those of you of my generation, I'm 51 years old. And by the way, when you're 51, you're just thankful you keep all your hair, you're not losing it, so I'm just getting gray, I'm happy with that. Okay? God is still good that way. But what did they tell you when you were going to school? No talking in the hallways. No running in the hallways. No littering. No loitering. We never heard about these gangs and drugs. 
But now we have that. We didn't have to go through metal detectors. And when we brought something that was dead, we all just want to look at it. No one wants to use it. Somebody brings a knife, we're all like, wow. Look at that. Look at that. We pass it around and we look at it, put it back in the bag because it will be confiscated. But it's a different, different problem now. We need to trust God. See, the side light. That happens. So, in this verses, if you will look, just read in the read, read at home. What happens now is because all the women and children were taken by the Amalekites, the very men that David was leading, they want to kill a man. Read it. Go read it home. There's a crisis now, and what they want to do is terminate David, not fire him. Like you always said here, you're not fired by it. That's not going to happen. There ain't no way. But what they were saying is this. Let's go kill him now. You know, in their grief, they want to kill him. Now, David is a warrior. Even before this, David has been in war. Who did he kill? Okay, so maybe this is a Goliath situation. And you know what? If I were David, if I were David because I'm not, I'd be going, do hmm, you want to kill me? All right. Let's have at it. One at a time, man to man. I'd probably be like that. Arrogant and stupid. It's true. I remember one time there was a demon possessed person, and as a 26 year old, fully built, no fat, well, maybe some fat, but I was like 200 pounds boxing. I said, let me go and stop that guy until the pastor told me, hey, look, that guy will throw you through the wall and kill you. He said, that little guy? He's possessed. Don't do that. And so I have this tendency to just go rush in and believe in myself. But no, David was not like that. At this stage of his life, verse 8, it says, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? And the Lord answered, pursue them. He answered, you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. What happened next, of course, was something that was absolutely fascinating. If you look at it from the logistical point of view, women and children held hostage, rescued. And it says, David did not lose a single one of them. Wow. You know what? As a pastor, that's what we want. As a pastor, that's what we pray for. Lord, please don't let me lose anyone. You can discern personality, right? I have a feeling your pastor has that kind of personality. I'm, I'm way different from him. I don't know why we're friends. <laughs> I'm sort of the guy that will get in your face and, you know, you hit your wife, I'll be there at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, figuring out how we're going to settle this with the police and whatever you want, but he's not like that. And so this, this even temperedness, this calmness, comparatively, I see that that's how he is. And so this pastor wants to lose nobody. That's the first point. The second point is this. God gives many victories to his people through his servant. You know this? He didn't, this, this part of scripture doesn't say the servant will have the victory. The under shepherd of the church will have the victory. You know, if you read the New Testament, you read Timothy, you read Titus, and you see, it doesn't talk a lot about victory, it talks a lot about persevering. Pastoring is hard. Pastoring is hard. Pastoring takes a heart that says, okay, it's not my problem, but you know what, I'm going to pray for that. But some people, they're able to pray and forget you, right? Oh, hey, I prayed for this, so I forget you. But when you're a real pastor, every cut cuts into you. And then you have to go and pretend that nothing happens. You know, you're, you're not that concerned. We need to go and come in and say, oh, okay, everything's stable, God is working, God is good. And it's not being plastic, it's just that's the calling. Because part of that, and again, that will be explained a little bit more. We don't want to give a bad testimony. We don't want you to think that God is incapable. You know? And you know, that's what I do. Every time that there's a crisis, I don't want to seem like, okay, it's happening to you, not happening to me. And no, not, not like that. But I want to go and I want to be able to say, God is handling this. God is handling this. Who of you have lived overseas? Show of hands just real quick. Live, lived overseas, born overseas? Okay, so you've seen what overseas is, right? 
Now, if you today slept, or last night, starting last night, slept in a bed, have a roof over your head, okay? And when you are hungry or thirsty, you can drink or eat on demand. You are richer and more prosperous than 75% of the world. Think about it. Remember the good old days? When food had to be rationed, because that was how, I know it doesn't look like that. <laughs> Did I tell you that testimony? My father said, please, Lord, don't let my children go hungry. We will serve you, but don't let my children go hungry. Now all of us on a diet, <laughs> using noni, using supplements. Why? Because sometimes you need to be hungry, it's good for you. But we were never hungry. No, we were never hungry. Food was rationed, but there was always enough. And then we got to America. Look what happened. <laughs> Look what happened. I have a job. Can I eat the hamburger? Oh, you mean I don't have to save for three months before I can eat hamburger at the restaurant? Wow. And I can buy my date a hamburger. I'm a cheap date. But I can love it. And so we think about these things and how good God is. And I would like to say to you, there are good things that God wants you to accomplish. And you know what? Your pastor is your first and foremost cheerleader. You know? We learn that we do not have to be envious because you drive the nicer cars. I don't know how Spartan is it, but I have become more and more Spartan. The more and more that I've been in ministry, the more and more that I've been given charge of certain things, I've lost my pace for the serious stuff. The first that went was jewelry. The next was nice cars. The next was nice clothes. And now I just realized you can get healthy when you go to 99 cent store. There's no shame in that. I'm okay with that. And I'm not coming back to the extravagance. Why? Because God is good and these are not the things that we are supposed to accomplish. I'm not supposed to keep currency in my pocket. I'm supposed to work on the currency of heaven. And the currency of heaven is what? It's souls. I saw a lot of cars out there. Okay, first challenge, sorry. I saw a lot of cars out there. How many times have those cars brought new people to the church? Especially those of you who are men. I'm sorry, I have a tendency to challenge men because you know what? I don't know how to be a woman. <laughs> For 51 years, okay, my dad would probably say 20 years a boy, 31 years a man, okay? But I don't know how to be a female. And I understand, ladies, don't pick up some guy on the street and bring them to church, especially if you're all alone and you have no bodyguard. Call me. I'll ride with you. I sort of have an idea how to handle things like that. But, man, if you haven't taken your car and brought someone to church ever, not given a ride to a co-worker or you know, someone who's here, but you know, someone you want to have him hear the word of God. If that hasn't happened in your lifetime, I pray it happens now. Why? Because you're part of the team. And you need to put currency in heaven. And so God will give victories to his servants. Verse 18 to 19. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, or boy or girl. Plunder anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. Wow. Peter says, I will restore, I will restore. I will restore all of this and more. And that's the job of the pastor. I used to tell my, my members, look, I don't care what's already in the house, but I want to know when things go out. When money goes out, because you know what, there's all these crows. But you know what? Every time, every time, God sees to it that everything is put back into place. I know for a fact that certain people will go and live in a crisis and sort of feel like they're losing their dignity. But in the end, you know, this lady felt like that. But in the end, when she died, there were two organists in her funeral. There are lots of people. God gives back that dignity. So in the end, you want to look at that picture. You want to look at that full picture and see what God's plan is really. And God's plan may involve, may involve or may include giving you the material things, but the truth of the matter is, the currency in heaven is the most important. 
God's not going to ask you if you drive a Rigetti 2005 Corolla or a brand new BMW today. But you know what? God will take notice of the fact that there was this person that needed to hear the word of God and for some reason they went with you. That's currency of heaven. Next, point number three. A pastor leads his people to the presence of God. And you know what? This is doubly true. We talk about double honor today, but this is doubly true. You know, when my praise and worship team sings, I don't bother. Okay? I may sing, and sometimes a lot of it is comedy. <laughs> right? Yeah, I can sing. I was in a choir. I can read notes and all that. Yes, I can carry a decent tune. Not like these people. And by the way, again, I'm going to, repo I'm going to repeat something that I said before. Your, your praise and worship team sounds like they have a voice coach. <laughs> we don't have that. <laughs> but here I am, and I do that, but I see your pastor and he's singing with the choir. Not preaching at the choir, but singing with the choir. <laughs> the first thing that happens in person worship, of course, is we open avenues in order that the presence of God be made manifest. It's a beachhead thing, you know? It's a marine kind of thing. Hoorah and all that. Because what's happening is we're saying, this is our beachhead. And where you are currently, where you are, is a place where there is a lot of interference. There are, there are things that we do not see that's happening, you know, from the tourist spot. Really, that's what's happening. But whatever it is that's happening there, when we do the praise, and you know what? I, kudos to you guys. You know how to do praise and worship. I'm at a church right now where they have separate services. One for traditional in the beginning, and one for uh, you know, the contemporary praise and worship, and then they come together at 11 o'clock. But even then, I see what the praise and worship is sharing. Wow. The leaders do mean what they do. They're not standing there just for the heck of it to play the music and to sing the songs. These people are building a church. And your pastor, when he sings with the choir, is not just singing for the sake of being able to sing. I know he loves to sing. There was a time, I this, this much I knew because I did a background there about five years ago. Just, just out of curiosity, nothing bad. <laughs> I found out this guy does this for a living. Did, did this for a living for a while. Now, why did you want to become a matinee idol? <laughs> why do you want to do this? Really sure? Did anyone ever ask you that, Pastor, in the beginning? <laughs> you really want to do this? All that talent? I don't know if he was ever asked that, but I, I was asked that several times. I said, you really want to do this? <laughs> you know what you're getting yourself into? <laughs> and you know, I asked no. But what choice do I have? I have a calling. I have no choice. I know. And the pastor here is leading the people to the presence of God. So first, a pastor inquires okay, of God for his people. Two, then he leads them to the presence of God. And I'm pretty sure most of you will know, if the presence of God is not here, you will sense it. You will sense it. And I'm pretty sure you know right now the presence of God is here. It has nothing to do with me. You know? My little 30 minutes here is not the reason why God's presence is here, or the word is being preached today from here. No. Because God's presence is here. And you know what? If I'm not capable of preaching today, then the Word of God will still have been preached. You already know that in the literal. But even then, the presence of God is here. And we need to appreciate that. So, 2 Samuel 6, verse 1, David again brought together all the able-bodied young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bela in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between cherubim on the ark. David, there's a whole long story there. We, you know what? Even the pastor has said something about Samuel this morning, okay? Now, consider that a prompting. There's, a, there's books, if you didn't know, called First and Second Samuel. Might be nice to read, okay? Now, again, when I tell people to read the Bible, and you, some of you, don't raise your hands, but some of you may be reading the Bible again and again, the whole Bible, and my suggestion is this. Go ahead and read John, okay? Go ahead and read John, then the New Testament, but read portions of the Old Testament. 
because it reinforces everything and makes it whole. You know? A lot of us are New Testament Christians when it comes to the New Testament. When we look at the Old Testament and go, uh, and he begot, he begot, he begot. <laughs> and he not begot pa. No. That's not what we want. Right? We want a balanced life. And here what happened is David wanted to bring the presence of God to the people. It was something that was a priority. And back then, that was a that was a perilous thing to do. Because in this account, a man touches the ark and dies. That's the ark. And so sometimes even in the risk of death, this is what we want. So in conclusion, I will say this. I'm almost there, right? I'm the close. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. Now, how am I going to use this as my conclusion if your pastor is an embarrassment? But you know what? By God's grace, he is not. If there are rumors out there about activities at 2 o'clock in the morning, or this or that, how are we going to claim this? As something that is applicable today. And you know what? That testimony is not occurring just now or started last month. Because again, we knew each other as younger men. Yeah, we were young then. <laughs> we were young ones. I'm watching some movies of Brad Pitt and I go, hey man, we used to move like that, not look like that. <laughs> we used to move like that. No, sometimes my son, who's 16 years old, needs to help me. You know, because I sometimes lie on the floor. Nothing wrong, just lying on the floor to stretch out. And sometimes he has to help me. To make it easier, I can still get up. <coughs> if this testimony was not true, and not true in the course of a life, and not true on the basis of previous things that have happened, then this is a bad thing. And you know what? This is a waste of time. And so I'm going to repeat the challenge that I had. This was not part of my first sermon here, but for some reason it hit me again. And today, that, that was not deliberate when I delivered it this the first time. But today it is deliberate. Do you pray? Because if you don't pray, then there's not going to be any empowerment in your life. If you do not have a consistent prayer life, there is no empowerment. And as I look at all you guys, I don't know a whole lot of you in the sense of intimacy, okay, of knowing particular details. But I know for a fact that if, okay, if you want to be used by God, there are some mighty things that you can do. There are some big and mighty things that God has planned for you. And He is going to allow that to happen. And you know what? Your pastor is going, yes, Lord. You know? I have a feeling this pastor is going, Lord, if someone wants to leave my church and start a mega church, let it be. Let it be. Because I'm sure this pastor knows he's not going to go hungry. And I know that. We are not trying to keep people in church. We want people who are called to church to be in church. Okay? But then after that, if there's a call, then so be it. I'm pretty sure hands will be laid. And prayers will be said. And maybe even tangible support. But so God wants to do that. But this pastor, this pastor that serves you here, that was called here, wants you to be successful. And I will even hazard to say, more successful than him, if at all possible, if God works. The second challenge is this. Do you pray for your pastor every day? Because if you don't, then what's the point? Do we come to church to socialize? Okay, no, no, don't answer, don't nod, don't raise your hands. But isn't it that this pastor is anointed so that he would be part of that process where the conduit of God's blessing is under his care? Are you blessed when you come to church? Are you blessed when you hear the word? Are you blessed when you hear praise in worship? When you receive counseling that you don't have to pay for from the scripture? 
that this man has spent his life on and still spends his life on in learning. Aren't you blessed? So if you're coming to church and not praying for your pastor every day, what's the point? What's the point? And I would pray for this. Some friendly advice. Pray that God will put a hedge around you. Pray that the angels will be there to comfort him in times of hardship. Pray that he will send friends, true friends, not fair-weather friends who only need his help, but friends that would really watch and pray. Pray that there will be a hedge upon his family. Pray that there will be a hedge upon his mind and his heart, that the Holy Spirit will always be there, and that he would continue to bend, manifest in ministry. The role of being a conduit of God's blessing to you. You better pray for this pastor. He needs it. And I would have, I would even dare say, the Lord requires it. People think that double honor in scripture sometimes means yes, we respect him, but also we compensate him. But I say to you, loving your pastor is the double honor. Praying for him is the manifestation of the practice of God. May God add his blessing to the reading, the preaching, the teaching of Scripture in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.